The participants were Mr. Rhett Begley, Daniel Flores, Denise Paquette, and Caroline Trump. All of these people, although graduate students, are also professionals in the aerospace industry and uh, included myself, who just finished up this uh, master's degree program back in May for basically the fun of it. And my kids keep saying, you're nuts. Why would you go get another master's just for the fun of it? So my greatest hope is that someday they'll understand. Okay, so. Dr. Zubrin, why should the human race be concerned with going to Mars? There's a number of reasons. The first, the more immediate ones are scientific ones, and that, it, and that the exploration of Mars, which I believe can only be uh, fully done with uh, human beings on the sea, can potentially tell us an enormous amount about uh, our place in the universe. That is to say, the possibility is very real that there could have once been life on Mars. for about the first billion years of existence, let's just say it was warm and wet. And if the theory is true that life evolved uh, wherever physical and chemical conditions are, are appropriate, then life should have evolved on Mars and we should be able to find fossils of past life, if not existing present life, on Mars. And if we were to do that, that would prove that uh, life is a general phenomenon throughout the universe. Another point, which is that if Mars was once suitable for life, it is possible that it could be made so again. That is, all the things that life needs exist on Mars. Water, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all the important chemical elements. Human beings with our technology could potentially go to Mars and make it a new home for uh, humanity and a new place for human civilization to live and grow and a new frontier. Well, that voice might have sounded somewhat familiar to you, this audience. Turns out uh, I've known Dr. Zubrin for about 25 years, and over the years he has uh, participated in classes of various types that I've taught or been in, in this case. But that was from an interview that I did with Dr. Zubrin on WLRH, the public radio station in Huntsville, Alabama, in 1994. And for most of you sitting in the audience, you understand, this concept has been alive 30 years. We're still not there, but I think we're getting closer. And what this project was about was to show on paper that well, without a hundred billion dollars that a group of reasonable, reasonably sane graduate students could plan a mission to Mars and show not only that it was feasible, but that it can be done without breaking what's left of the national treasury. The first step in the program was to form a limited liability corporation. 
We had an association with a professor at the University of New Mexico, and so we picked as our company location Socorro. And so in the imagination, if nothing else, of these students and eventually I think our professors, the Mars Transit Bureau is alive and well in Socorro. <clears throat> okay, so the primary project thesis was, as I said, to plan a mission to Mars using, as Dr. Zubrin says, existing and very near-term technologies. And we took it upon ourselves to interpret the RFP that was given to us as a mandate to go somewhere and come safely back to Earth. It wasn't to develop a starship. It wasn't to build Battlestar Galactica in low Earth orbit. It was to go to Mars, spend 13 months exploring the surface, and come safely back to Earth. And in the process, leave a few artifacts on that surface that could be used by a future mission. Mars Transit Bureau was envisioned as an LLC functioning as a systems integrator and overall mission manager. Basically, what you see all around the beltway here, engineering and project management team to basically oversee the work that everybody else does, and in the process, uh, make a decent pass-through fee, right? So here's our registration papers in the state of New Mexico. We envisioned that, uh, and we were told, by the way, that the RFP came straight from NASA headquarters. So Mars Transit Bureau would report from Socorro to Washington, D.C. We elected to choose SpaceX hardware, primarily, with Bigelow inflatable HABs and transportation inhabited uh, modules based on their beam technology that's currently uh, being tested on the International Space Station. And we also, since we were going to assemble and launch the vehicles from Kennedy Space Center, we in uh, employed the participation of a local organization of the community that uh, promotes space technology called Space Florida. They're basically a, a new business incubator and organizer of everything that's space in the uh, Kennedy Space Center area. Here's the mission profile as we planned it. It would take five launches using an extended range version of the Falcon Heavy. And the extended range modifications include uh, addition of about 15% propellant to the second stage, and as Spe SpaceX has already envisioned and shown in some of their artwork, if nothing else, uh, landing legs on the second stage. Uh, basically, the first four missions would be cargo missions to first land the Mars descent vehicle, of which as Dr. Zubrin envisions would go about the business of making propellant and implanting a um, nuclear power generator of some reasonable size. The next two missions would include uh, 
lots of food and expendable items along with a rover on each mission. One of, by the way, one of the concepts, and I totally believe in Dr. Zubrin's approach of using an internal combustion engine type rover. Uh, as you saw on the movie, The Martian, which I have to watch at least once a week, I think. <laughs> it's a pain in the butt to have to recharge your entire rover power supply uh, every four or f six hours of travel or whatever that is. Now, it's a good concept, and a matter of fact, one of the vehicle's concepts we studied was using the Tesla Model X chassis for the Mars rover. And it looks like that might work. But as you see here, basically the first four missions land three vehicles on Mars, two rovers, one descent vehicle that's making propellant, and the fourth cargo mission puts into Mars orbit the Earth return vehicle that's basically a Falcon Heavy second stage with a Dragon V2 attached and uh, power supplies, etc., and sits there and waits for the fifth launch to take place, which would include a crew landing on the surface also in a Dragon V2. We had a young man, Daniel Flores, who <clears throat> spent a lot of time doing trajectory studies, pork chop plots, you name it. Uh, he is a contractor for Kennedy Space Center and is a counterpart to Alfred Menendez, who is one of the chief uh, orbital mechanics persons that works for NASA down at the Cape. And, um, if anybody ever ran across Al, you know that he is very thorough. He's an MIT grad. He likes to argue with you about things. <laughs> and uh, in spite of all that, Daniel came up with acceptable mission launch dates of uh, first opportunity for the Cargo 1 in August of 2022, uh, Cargo 2, August 2024, Cargo 3, the 2026 date, and uh, actually I think uh, there's a double up on one of those dates there. And finally the crew would be launched in September of 2028. Here's kind of what those vehicles would look like. Uh, basically an extended length second stage uh, with an enlarged payload fairing. Uh, nothing that would not be achievable, we think, with a bit of structural reinforcement on the second stage. Uh, there's a possibility, by the way, all of these uh, stages use the Merlin um, D version engine with a caveat that when and if the Raptor methane engine becomes available from SpaceX, we would uh, change over to that engine. Uh, here are the dates, the delta V required, time of flight in days, and some other uh, things that matter only to astrodynamicists, probably. Uh, here shows the uh, sorties again, and uh, basically the increase in the range of the second stage would raise the uh, capability to land on Mars 14.1 metric tons instead of the advertised 13.2, so that, you know, that's not a real unimaginable increase in performance. And then um, in orbit around Mars without an EDL, 15.2 tons uh, for the Earth return vehicle. And again, here's what those look like with uh, 
showing the <clears throat> rovers in cargo two and three, and the crew in man mission launch five. And this shows the allocations of payload weight. Uh, a lot of this came right out of Dr. Zubrin's uh, presentations, which we gave him credit for, of course, uh, with a little bit of um, imagination as to the distribution of food, water, oxygen, fuel, uh, first one thing and another. What you don't see here, the um, landing propulsion on the Dragon V2, that weight is carried in the overall Dragon weight up there, so um, you don't see that. Uh, there is no Dragon vehicle on uh, launches two and three that carry the rover, but three like uh, Dragon capsules would be used for the ver in various configurations as a standard uh, vehicle. Here are the basic phases uh, launched from the Cape. Uh, there you see in two the uh, Mars, Mars descent vehicle. Whoops, that's not good. The MAV and the ERV. And then over on the right, uh, rather, next slide is the inflatable cabin, which is a plan to be a derivative, a derivative of the beam that's up on the sta station now. For the study, we picked the Jezero crater, which was uh, derived, uh, boiled down from a list of 30 or 40 candidates uh, summer of 2015 by a group of people, including NASA and maybe some of you, who people who have an interest in going to Mars and where we should go, but this came out as a relatively safe place to land with lots of scientific curiosities and a uh, reasonable amount of predicted uh, in situ resources available for our use. Uh, this covers some of the features and work that might be accomplished at the landing site. Lots of things could be done. The primary uh, flow diagram of the Sabatier reactor that Dr. Zubrin has talked about for so many years and has been proven by lots of people, including I found out today, a, a group of high school students. So that's pretty foolproof, I would think. And here's what uh, Daniel did in terms of no, uh, I'm sorry, this is the communication satellites. If you noticed uh, uh, our situation now, and it's forecast the time in which our crew would be in orbit around Mars and on the surface, there would be a uh, shortage of communication satellites at that time because some of our current birds are going out of service predicted in that time frame. So as part of the study, we propose to put uh, satellites, three satellites, in uh, orbit about Mars, equivalent to what we would call a geostationary orbit here on Earth, which would basically provide constant communications on the surface to Earth from about 65 north to 65 south. And just some stuff on that. Uh, the spacesuit I've talked about in a couple of presentations today. Here are some of the uh, existing suits dating back to the Apollo, the NASA Z series of advanced suits with uh, interface with uh, Mars rover so that you can like take a run and jump into the suit and close the door behind you and you're on the surface. Uh, so that's pretty good. The whole idea, of course, to do a uh, surface activity suit is to be able to move and do some real work. Uh, and Georgia Tech did a study that said the best concept available these days is the work that Deva, Dr. Deva Newman is doing up at MIT, which is uh, the bio suit. I'm sure you all know about it. And um, this is what it looks like, kind of. This is just the um, 
maybe the innermost layer or certainly the first layer over the undergarment with the water cooling and stuff incorporated, but this suit allows you to only pressurize the helmet, only provide an atmosphere in the helmet. The other life-sustaining tissue pressure is provided by mechanical means. It's called mechanical counterpressure. First envisioned back in 1970 and demonstrated by Dr. Paul Webb. But since there was not the right kind of materials around at that time, NASA elected not to continue funding it. But Dr. Newman and her group, and you see her recent, one of her recent doctoral graduates here, Allie Anderson, modeling the suit and helmet. Uh, it's based on a principle that uses the uh, lines of non-extension that exist on the human body, such that when you move and work, there are certain places that don't extend, don't stretch. So you can put kind of a hard uh, thread there and increase pressure using various means to maintain the uh, uh, required around four and a half PSI or something on the, on the tissue. Uh, for the backpack or the portable life support system, another paper I presented where we look at using a technology derived from existing commercial state-of-the-art deep dive uh, scuba rebreathers uh, made by Dive Right out of Lake City, Florida called the Optima and uh, weighs about 59 pounds on Earth fully loaded with uh, fluids and on Mars it would weigh about 20 pounds or so, something like that. Um, of course, uh, we would uh, only use part of the technology. The Mars PLSS would be a 100% oxygen system operating at 4.3 PSI, 12 hour maximum including four hours of emergency uh, duration in case you got your foot caught in a rock or something after an eight hour EVA. Or maybe you passed out because you were exhausted or who knows what happens but Maybe somebody would have time to find Mark Watney before they left if he had four hours of reserve. We also did a quantitative risk assessment, and I reported on that in a very boring paper that I gave about an hour ago. Only, only mathematicians and statistics teachers like me probably cared for that. Uh, but anyways, uh, using the space mission and analysis and design document and a brand new text that just came out with lots of real launch hardware uh, reliability numbers. You can do some pretty good analyses of a what if situation. Here's the uh, mission uh, crude uh, point estimate that shows a 0.9339 mean probability of success and a 0.95 probability 90% uh, or less of the time. Also, I mentioned that we were going to try to do it with reasonable cost. So what, the, what we did was we developed a work breakdown structure, statement of work, top level, based on all the kinds of things you would have to do to uh, undertake such a mission, assigned some reasonable estimates to those, ran a point estimate of that cost, and then proceeded to assign each task a triangular distribution with plus or minus 10% variation, turned the crank 5,000 times, and that's what you get. What it shows is that using uh, Palisades at risk software, that you could do this mission 90% of the time for about $6 billion and um, leave some stuff on the surface that might be used. Now this is not supporting a large infrastructure of NASA centers or giant 
contractors like Boeing or anybody else. This is a lean and mean fighting machine of, you know, a couple of dozen people in Socorro, New Mexico, sipping tequila made from cacti and watching everybody else doing a fantastic job. And I believe that uh, with that sort of philosophy and a no-nonsense approach of let's go somewhere like the settlers who went out west uh, when we discovered gold in California, that we could do that. So it was a lot of fun. We worked about four months on it. We turned in a page limited proposal that had 100 pages and 400 pages of uh, appendices. And we made a presentation that lasted two hours and we, uh, we all got an A. And the people that gave us that A, uh, we respected them before we got the A, but we really <laughs> respected them after. <laughs> because it was obvious they really recognized good talent when they saw it. But in summary, I'd like to say that uh, the Mars Transit Bureau uh, it says here, was pleased to submit the proposal for the first human mission to Mars. And we've shown on paper that with not too unreasonable assumptions, not too much tequila, that we could make that happen and get the people back alive by 2030. Uh, it, God bless you. We would accomplish that by a no-nonsense approach of going somewhere with existing and near-term technology, not developing a starship or building Battlestar Galactica, but going somewhere and getting back the best way we can today. And I think with your help, and if you're like me, who plans to have a serious discussion with my state senator and his influence with those uh, desiring to be president of the United States, I think we could make it happen. It will not occur if we just throw up our hands and sit back and say, WTF. <laughs> what can we do? Forgive me, Catholic University of America. But I think if we do take an active role, as each real citizen should, that we can make it happen. You have to be passionate about something. And if Robert Zubrin has demonstrated anything in the last 30 or 40 years, it is that he's passionate about going to Mars. And I think most of you are too. Any questions? Thank you. <clears throat> Let me say that I do appreciate and thank the Catholic University of America for the great facilities that they provided to the conference. And if you're like me, you're really enjoying it. And um, onward and upward. Thank you very much.